Hi, my congratulations on the beginning of your studies in the second semester. Sit down, please, quicker, quicker. Go, go up and take your seats. Some students are late. Okay, in this semester, we start a course of general physics. And this course will take five semesters, two and a half years. And before we go, before we proceed with the material of the first semester, which will be mechanics, I would like to draw a simple sketch for you. I will draw a coordinate axis and a long horizontal axis I will show uh, velocity. All types of velocities from zero to the velocity of light and this will be in logarithmic scale something like c over 10, one tenth of the velocity of light. And along the vertical axis I will show uh, the distances uh, or the length. And uh, here will be some lengths, uh, arbitrary lengths, but very small one, close to atomic scale. Let it be something like one nanometer. So in this sketch, if we consider small velocities, and very small distances, then in this area we will find physical phenomena related to atoms moving at relatively small velocities. And all the phenomena uh, occurring in this scale, in this area, all the phenomena are studied by quantum physics. If we go to a larger scale, somewhere here, at small velocities and larger scale, this is classical mechanics. And certainly thermodynamics. Thermodynamics. If we go to a large velocities, large velocities and small scales, small distances, uh, phenomena occurring in, in this, uh, under these conditions are described by relativistic quantum physics or high energy physics. And if we go to the area described by high velocities and large distances. This is relativistic physics, or a theory of special relativity. Uh, theory of special relativity. So this is special relativity. And certainly electrodynamics. Electrodynamics. So depending on what velocity you have, on what speed, whether the speed is high, close to the speed of uh, light, or if the speed is small, much smaller than the speed of light, you will have quite different physical phenomena described by different theories. Certainly, if you take formulas of special relativity and allow the speed of objects in these formulas to tend to zero. So if you go to small velocities, then you will obtain classical mechanics from special relativity. So there is logical connection, strong logical connection between these theories. Uh, in the course of general physics here, you will study classical mechanics and thermodynamics. That will be the first semester. 
and that will be the second semester of uh, general physics. Also, you will study special relativity and electrodynamics. That will be a third semester. Uh, and optics. Optics will come here. And so third and fourth semester. And also, you will study quantum physics uh, during the last semester, number five. You will not study high energy physics in the course of general physics here. High energy physics is uh, still developing uh, field of physics, which is studied in the course of theoretical physics. Before we proceed with our discussion of mechanics, I would like to show you two simple experiments from the field of mechanics. Uh, the first experiment will be this one. I take a ball and put it here and allow for this ball to roll down so that it goes through the loop. If I put the ball a little bit lower, it still goes through the loop. But if I put it here, it will fall down somewhere in the middle, and also here. That's it. It's very simple phenomenon. It's very simple problem in mechanics. And uh, you should certainly know how to solve this problem if you know the radius of this loop you will be, must be able to calculate the height which is necessary for the ball to start its motion in order to go through the loop, loop and not fall down. You should be able to solve this problem. Even now, you have enough knowledge to solve it. And also, I wanted to show you another interesting phenomenon in mechanics, which is too complicated. Uh, and you will be unable to explain it now. You still have not enough knowledge to explain this phenomenon. But uh, by the end of this semester, you will be able to explain it. The phenomenon is very simple. We have a curved surface, curved metal surface, this object, just arbitrary curved surface, and a kind of gyroscope. You see what happens? The axis of this gyroscope goes along the curved surface, repeating its, uh, its form. And the axis is always pressed against this metal surface somehow. Why? Why does it go in this way, in this strange way? you will be able to explain it in a matter of two months from now. Well, well the, when the velocity of rotation, the speed of rotation is small, uh, there is no such interesting effect. Nothing interesting happens. And uh, in order to observe this effect, the speed of velocity, the angular velocity, should be, uh, should be enough for the forces of friction to influence the motion of this uh, axis of this gyroscope. So prepare yourself to be ready to explain this phenomenon. And now we start with mechanics, with uh, theoretical consideration. And uh, certainly we start from kinematics. And our consideration of all this, <laughs> our consideration will be based on the knowledge which you have already acquired. Uh, you know a lot, actually. 
you know what is the uniform motion, what is the motion uh, of a material point with constant speed, you know what is the uniform acceleration, what is the motion with constant acceleration, you know something about the motion along a circular trajectory, so you know a lot practically and uh, our further consideration will be based on your knowledge. Uh, kinematics considers methods to describe motion. Kinematics is not interested in the causes of motion. It's not interested in what's behind the motion of the bodies. Uh, kinematics is just engaged in description of motion. Whatever motion you have, you must be able to describe it, paying no attention to the causes of this motion, what caused such a motion of a body. But if a body moves in certain way, you must be able to describe this motion theoretically using appropriate formulas. Uh, so in order to describe the motion of a point particle, we must be able to define the position of a particle, the position of moving body. And uh, there are several different ways to describe the position and motion of bodies. So the first method to describe uh, position and motion is the natural method, so-called natural method. Suppose you have a point which moves along some trajectory, and uh, point A moves with some velocity, moves along some trajectory. It may be a motor vehicle running along the road, for example. How can we describe the position of such motor vehicle? We must choose a point of reference, the origin. It may be a stone nearby the road. And then we will be able to measure the distance covered by this motor vehicle. The distance s will be a function of time. The distance of our motor vehicle A from the origin O. This is the positive distance. And if another motor vehicle is here, this will be a negative distance if it goes and this way, here, the distance will be negative. And in this direction, the distance will be positive. It's very simple. We measure the distance covered by a motor vehicle along, along the road. So if the position of this point changed in time, then in some moment in time, there will be another position. So that during this time interval, the motor vehicle went from point A to point A prime. And in this case, we can define the velocity as the path covered by the motor vehicle from point A to point A prime divided by the time interval. This is the so-called average velocity. Average velocity is denoted by such brackets. Average velocity of the motor vehicle on some uh, displacement. Delta S may be any, any length. It may be 100 kilometers. It may be 15 kilometers. Whatever distance you choose, 
at any distance, you may find the average velocity if you divide distance by the appropriate time interval. However, if point A is chosen to be close to point uh, A prime is chosen to be close to point A, then delta S will be very small. It may be 100 meters or even 10 meters or 5 meters or less. And the appropriate time interval will be small. And in this case, you will find the possibility to use this formula to calculate the instant velocity, the velocity at point A. The instant velocity, it's not an average velocity. It's the velocity at this particular moment of time. In mathematics, this would be written as the limit of delta S over delta T when delta T tends to 0. And in physics, it's denoted by dS over dt. That is the differential of S divided by differential of t. Have you learned calculus? Do you know what is differential? Can you differentiate fu functions? Do you know anything about it? Who can tell me? You know what is a derivative, do you? OK. So what is ds? It's a small distance. In mathematics, a time interval goes to 0, tends to 0. In physics, we don't say that it tends to 0. In physics, it remains very small but finite time interval. And uh, distance ds is very small compared to, the, uh, to other distances in this motion. It's very small in comparison with other distances, but still it's uh, finite. We don't say in physics that this is a infinitesimal tending to zero. Why so? In physics, it's senseless. In physics, it's impossible to uh, to allow the distance to go to tend to zero. Because if you go to a smaller and smaller distances, finally you will reach the, dis the dimension of one atom. And at such small distances, physics changes. There are different laws of physics. There are laws of quantum physics at such small distances. And if you allow for the distance to go even further, even smaller, you will reach the dimension of a nucleus, uh, the diameter of a proton, for example, or a neutron. And then physics is quite different. It's not, uh, it doesn't coincide with quantum physics at uh, nuclear dimensions. It will be closer to high energy physics because the energy of interaction inside nucleus is comparable to the energy of each particle. And if you go even further, you will reach the so-called Planck distance, where the physics must be absolutely different from what we see in our world and from what we see in quantum physics. So if you go to smaller and smaller distances, you will find that physics changes and the laws of physics change. And so it's, it's impossible. In physics, it's impossible to allow uh, the distance to uh, go to zero, to tend to zero. In physics, we always choose some very small but finite distance. What does it mean, small distance? What does it mean, very small and finite but, but finite uh, time interval? What is it? I give you a small example what dt may mean. It may, it may be, for example, <coughs> If I consider the motion of this ball, which rolls down the inclined, uh, the ramp, it goes down within a second. So very small time interval must be small compared to one second. So it may be about one millisecond. When I consider 
the motion of mechanical bodies in, in the laboratory. The time interval may be chosen like one millisecond, on one, one microsecond if you are not satisfied with this uh, approximation. But if I consider the motion of our planet Earth around the sun, the period of uh, rotation is one year. So small interval compared to one year, maybe about one hour or one minute. That will be dt. But if I consider the motion of the sun about the center of our galaxy, the period of this motion equals 250 million years. And so dt will be well, uh, will be uh, quite suitable. I, it will be quite suitable if I, find, if I choose for, for the dt a time interval like 1,000 years. That will be very small compared to 250 million years. Certainly, that will be very, very small amount of uh, time. So dt may be 1,000 years if you consider something very long. It may be about one minute, one hour, if you consider motion of planets around the sun. And it may, it may be one millisecond or one microsecond if you consider motion of mechanical bodies in the laboratory. So dt may be anything, even 1,000 years. Or it may be one millisecond, one microsecond. But it's always, in physics, it's always finite, but very small quantity. Small in comparison with what? In comparison with the time which takes this body to move. If you consider a car moving from, from one point to another point, and the car moves, it takes one hour for the car to go from one point to another point. If it takes one hour, what will be this small interval? Well, one second, probably. Maybe 10 seconds, that's enough. That may be taken, 10 seconds may be taken as a small time differential in this particular case. So in physics, dt is, depends on what problem we consider, but it's always, it's always small, but it's not infinitely small. It never goes to zero, like in mathematics. In mathematics, that's OK. But in physics, we deal with, with the nature. And the nature is very complicated, and it's different on different scales. Um, that's what can be said about the natural uh, method of to describe motion. Certainly, you know that we can uh, define acceleration, and the average acceleration will be uh, the final velocity minus initial velocity, and in order to uh, in order to distinguish the initial velocity from instant velo velocity, I will, I will put it like instant, and uh, divided by delta t. So if at this point the velocity was uh, initial, and here the velocity at this point, and here the velocity was final. So, well, it's. It's not very good. It's much better to use this formula as uh, the instant acceleration. Instant acceleration. It will be change of velocity during small interval of time. That's it. Ch instant acceleration is <coughs> much better. This should be uh, the correct formula to, to use in different problems. That is the change of velocity, the change of speed of the motor vehicle along uh, along the uh, along its path along the road, uh, and this formula is very tricky. It may lead you far away from reality uh, because the velocity may change. The car may go uh, 
in one direction and then in another direction. And this formula will give you something very uh, inappropriate in many, many cases. I mean this one. <coughs> and this is correct. So this, uh, what, what can be said in general words about the natural way to describe the motion, the motion along some path, along some given trajectory, like the motion of a motor vehicle along the road. Another method to describe the motion in kinematics, the second method is a coordinate method, a method of coordinates. method of coordinates. So we have to choose some coordinate system. And this may be x and y and z. And this is the or origin of coordinate system. And uh, uh, what does it mean, this uh, mathematical object? A coordinate system is a mathematical object. How can it be related to real physical objects, which we have to choose when we carry out measurements? If we want to choose a real physical reference system, we must choose some body with which some object, real object, with which to associate the reference system. Naturally, it's, it should be some solid body with which the origin is associated. And also, if we want to imagine some axis, we should be able to measure distances along this axis. And it means that we must have something like a rigid rod along this direction and another rigid rod in perpendicular direction and another rigid rod here. So if we want to measure actually the distances, we must have some mechanical rigid or solid system consisting of rods. And also there should be some uh, clocks to measure time wherever possible in every point. So in physical sense, the coordinate system should be associated with some real solid body. It may be this room in which we are si uh, sitting. It may be uh, the coordinate system may be associated with our planet Earth. Or the coordinate system may be associated with distant stars, for example. Or the coordinate system may be associated with a, a ship traveling somewhere in the seas, in the ocean. Anything, any body, any rigid body, any uh, real object must be taken to associate uh, the coordinate system. Uh, yes, certainly we can imagine a coordinate system like associated with nothing and just hanging in the free space. But this is our imagination. Yes, we can use it. But if you want to measure actually something. We must use real solid rods. And uh, is there any solid rod in nature? No. If you take any solid rod and study it, you will find that it can be deformed a little bit. It's not absolutely solid. It can be deformed. It can be bent a little bit if you apply force. So there are no solid rods in nature, but we use it. How can we do it? This is an approximation. An approximation. Uh, we take an ideal. We imagine that we have the possibility. We assume that we have the possibility to take an ideal solid rod, which, is, which cannot be deformed, which cannot be bent. This is an idealization. We neglect the small deformation which may take place. So to measure distances and to measure coordinates of a material point, I take a material point here, to measure the coordinates of this material point is a complicated problem, really. And 
to measure actually some distances, many different methods have been invented, like triangulation, like optical methods. It's, it's not a simple, it's not a too simple a procedure to measure coordinates of a body. But anyway, we assume that we can measure the coordinates, and so this point will have some coordinates. And so that we have uh, x coordinate of this body, which may be a function of time, and we have y coordinate, and we have z coordinate, which also may be a function of time. And in this case, the position of this body may be characterized by some radius vector. And uh, if we introduce unit vectors directed along the axis, that is vector i and j and k, then we can write down that the radius vector showing from uh, pointing from uh, the origin to our point A. The radius vector can be expressed in the following way. It will be unit vector i, x of t plus unit vector j, y of t plus unit vector k, z of t. That's the coordinate method to represent the position of point A, and radius vector is directed to point A and showing its position in space, in three-dimensional space. Certainly, we can calculate the vector of velocity. as time derivative of vector r. When calculus was developed, uh, two scientists made major contribution to calculus, Newton and Leibniz. Well, German people say Leibniz. In English, they say Leibniz. Leibniz, uh, Leibniz used this notation for a derivative. And Newton used something different. A derivative with respect to time in Newton's articles, in Newton's uh, books, uh, was denoted by r and dot. The dot means the derivative with respect to time. It's the same, just different notations. This is the notation of Leibniz. Leibniz And this is the notation of Newton. Both notations are widely used in physics, and both notations are quite suitable and convenient. And we will use both. And certainly, if we differentiate the first expression, which you can see in the first line here, we will take into account that vector i is constant. And so constant remains in its place we don't differentiate it, and we have to differentiate only function x of t. And also vector j is constant, and we have to take the time derivative of this coordinate y and plus vector k and time derivative of z. This is the vector of instant velocity. If you want to find the speed or the magnitude of this vector or the length of this vector, you have to use the Pythagorean theorem. And it will be x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared. So that will be the magnitude of this vector. Also, it's natural that any vector, including the vector of velocity, 
should be represented as the unit vector i times x component of velocity plus the unit vector g y component of the velocity plus unit vector k and z component of the velocity. Comparing this presentation of vector with, with this line, we can conclude that x component of the velocity is just time derivative of this function x of t. And y component of the velocity is time derivative of y of t. And also, z component of the velocity is z dot as a function of t. Similar formulas, similar formulas will be appropriate for acceleration. The same way we can define acceleration, the vector of acceleration as vector of velocity dot, the time derivative with respect to vector v of t. And we can use the same logic and obtain that this will be i x two points vector i plus vector j y two points plus vector k z two points. And the same logic applies to all this formula. You can find using similar uh, Pythagorean theorem expression, you can find the magnitude of this vector. And all these coefficients, x, two dots, and y, two dots, etc., can be represented as the x component of the vector of acceleration. And this is y component of the vector of acceleration. And this is z component of the vector of acceleration of a given material point A. What is a material point we discussed in detail in the last semester? And you know that material point is anything, any object, whose dimension is much smaller than the characteristic dimension of its uh, char characteristic size of its trajectory. The Earth may be considered as a material point if you study the motion of Earth around the Sun because the dimension of Earth is much smaller than the diameter of its uh, orbit about the Sun. So even the Earth may be considered as a material point. OK. Five minutes interval. Have a good rest.
So during this uh, small interval, five minute interval, you may stand up and go a little bit to and fro. It's, it's not a problem. It's your time. Five minute interval, it's your time. You don't have to be seated here, okay? So I would, I would like to say a few words. Before going further, I would like to say a few words about this formula. This formula certainly is correct, but only for a uniformly accelerated motion, then it will be mm, absolutely correct. Is if the acceleration is constant. If acceleration is not constant, then this formula will give you no, no good information. So we have considered two methods to describe motion, the natural methods, the natural method, and the coordinate method. And now method number three, uh, vector description of coordinates. A vector description of coordinates. Uh, what does it mean? It means that we certainly have the same uh, system of coordinates with its origin in point A, and there is somewhere point uh, point O origin with point O, and there is somewhere a material point a material point A, and we introduce a vector R and work with with this vector, which is certainly in general case a function of time. And before, before considering a vector presentation of uh, the position of point and the vector presentation of its motion, I would like to talk a little bit about vectors. What is a vector? You certainly know very well that vector is a segment with direction a segment which has the beginning and the end. And two points are not equivalent. One, one point is the beginning of the segment and another point is the end of the segment. But that is not all. There are many interesting things about vectors. First of all, vectors can be added. If you have vector A and vector B, then the sum of these two vectors can be found using the parallel parallelogram rule. We draw a line parallel to B and another line parallel to A through the end of this vector. And then the diagonal will represent the sum of these two vectors. This is the parallel parallelogram method to find, uh, geometrically, to find the sum of two vectors. Certainly there is another way to find the sum of two vectors. If we have vector A and vector B, we can draw vector B starting from the end of vector A, and then we will have a triangle. And uh, another, the last side of this triangle will represent the sum of two vectors. So this will be A plus B. But we can start from vector B and then draw vector A. And again, we will obtain the triangle and the sum of two vectors. And that will be B plus A. And as the par parallelogram consists of two equal triangles, so that this triangle is equal to this triangle, then the B plus A should be equal to A plus B. A plus B equals B plus A. That is a commutative law of addition. Uh, the result of adding two vectors does not depend on which order you, you choose. You may, which order uh, uh, you choose to add the two vectors. This is very important property of vectors. And this property is not always correct. It, it's not always true. Sometimes for some vectors, uh, this formula holds. For other vectors, it's invalid. And I will show you uh, some demonstration. But before we go further, uh, I will disapprove. I will. I will prove that this is incorrect sometimes. But before we go to this demonstration, I would like to give you an example when 
we have some vectors, but it's absolutely impossible to add them together. Absolutely impossible. For example, suppose we have a crossing of two streets. This is a street A, and this is street B. And some motor vehicles move along the street A, and in this particular point of crossing, we have four motor vehicles, four vehicles, four motor vehicles per second move along the street A in this direction. And uh, some motor vehicles move along the street B, and here we have three motor vehicles per second moving in this direction. So it seems to be a vector showing how many motor vehicles move in this direction, and this seems to be also a vector showing how many motor vehicles go in this direction along street E. But these two vectors cannot be added together. If we simply add one vector and another using the rule for adding vectors, we will find, we will come to conclusion that some motor vehicles every minute strike at this building which is at the corner of this street, which is absolutely senseless. Nothing like that happens. So we have some vectors which cannot be added. Sometimes it happens. Another example, another important example on this issue is a, a beam of light. Suppose we have a beam of light here. The light propagates here. That is a beam of light. And another beam of light, which propagates here. Two searchlights cross each other. Photons fly here in this beam of light. And we can introduce a vector showing how many photons per second go through a unit area of cross-section of this light beam. This is called a pointing vector, actually. A pointing vector in electrodynamics describes the intensity of light. Actually, it's a number of photons going through a unit cross-section area in one second. And we can introduce another vector showing how many photons go uh, through a unit area of cross-section in one second in another in a second beam. Now, this is the vector. In electrodynamics, it's a pointing vector and another pointing vector. But can we add them? No. If we add these two pointing vectors, we will come to a conclusion that some third beam of light goes here from the intersection. But this never happens. This beam of light, third beam of light, has never been observed and cannot be observed. It's non-existent. Two pointing vectors cannot be added together. Sometimes it happens. Not any vector is actually a real vector. Some vectors do not possess this property. They cannot be added. So they are something like not quite real vectors. We, we may call them vectors, but we should keep in mind that the word is vector However, the same word, but the properties are different. The properties are quite different. So which way of adding vectors? Uh, wh what I wanted to, t to say that if we have vectors, we should always keep in mind this problem, that vectors do not always add together. And if we want to add together some vectors, we should, first of all, justify and make sure that this is possible. If we have vector of uh, a position of a particle, can we add such vectors together? Yes. If we have several uh, different origins associated with different coordinate systems, then in one coordinate system, the position will be of vector A. In another coordinate system, the position will be vector B. And in another coordinate system, the position will be vector C. For example, this is the vector 
showing the position of a, of a train. And this is the vector showing the position, the motion of a person along the train car. So the position and motion of a person which, who goes along the train car will be uh, shown by these two vectors. And the sum of these two vectors will show the position and motion of this person with relation to the Earth. This vector shows uh, the motion of a person relative to the car. And this vector shows the motion of the train car, railway car, uh, relative to the Earth. And the person may, may hold something in his hands and make something like this. And that will be described by another vector. And so the motion of this third object will be given by a geometric sum of all these three vectors. So vectors of position can be added together if we have several different bodies and several different systems of reference associated with each body. And each vector is the position of something relative to the appropriate uh, system of reference, appropriate uh, origin. And uh, if we talk about vectors and vector description of motion, I would like to introduce I would like to introduce a vector of rotation. Suppose we have some point which can rotate about the axis. And this is the axis. And the point can rotate in this way. And that is point A, which can rotate about this axis. And this is the radius vector to this point. And so from initial position, a, this point moves to some other position, A prime. And in some time interval, it will be described by a different radius vector. And the radius vector will turn by angle phi or phi, angle, some angle showing the rotation of this vector, which points to the moving point point rotates about the axis. And I would like to introduce the vector of rotation. And by definition, as in mathematics, uh, is it, it's accepted in mathematics, the vector of rotation should be directed along the axis of rotation. But it may be directed either upward or downward. How to choose the direction of vector of rotation by angle phi? Using the right screw rule, if you rotate the screw in this direction, then it will move along the axis in the direction of the vector of rotation. So if we move, if we rotate the screw in this way, then it will move in the direction. If, the, if point A moves in different direction, then we should turn the screw in different direction, and then the vector phi will be directed, will have opposite direction. So uh, such is the way to introduce the vector of rotation. Uh, and now we will ask an important question. Is it a real vector? Can two or three such vectors be added together? Uh, in order to answer this question, I will show you a simple experiment with rotating such a, such a body. Rotating such a body. I will show you this, this brick. And I will rotate it about vertical axis and about horizontal axis, like this. First, I will rotate it about horizontal axis. That will be the result. And then I will rotate it about vertical axis. That's the result. Now I start from the same position. And first, I will rotate it about vertical axis. That will be the result. 
Oh, let, let's do it in different. That's the result. And now I will rotate it about the horizontal axis. That's the result. You see the difference? So if I rotate this body uh, by 90 degrees, then the result of two rotations will depend on the order of rotations. If I first rotate it about the vertical axis and then about the horizontal axis, the result will be this one. But if I choose to rotate first about the horizontal axis and then about the vertical axis, the result will be different. It means that vectors of rotation are not quite vectors. Yes, we can introduce this vector, but we cannot add them together. Vectors of rotation cannot be added, like the pointing vectors in optics, in electromagnetics, uh, in electricity and magnetism, and like the vectors showing the flow of cars, the intensity of car motion. So uh, vector of rotation is not a real vector. It's something which cannot be added. Two vectors of rotation cannot be added. Now I will repeat the same experiment, but I will use rotation by a very small angle, not 90 degrees, but small angle. So uh, suppose first I rotate about vertical axis by a very small angle, and then I rotate about horizontal axis by a very small angle. That's the result. If I change the order of rotations, first I rotate about horizontal axis, and then about vertical axis. Uh, about vertical axis, that's it. The result is the same. So if I use small angles of rotation, then the order of rotations can be changed. I can first rotate about the vertical axis and then about horizontal, or vice versa. I can first rotate about horizontal and then about vertical axis. The result will be the same if the angles of rotation are small. But if the angles are large, then we, we, we saw it. The result is quite different. So for large angles of rotation, the vector of rotation angle is not really a vector. They cannot be added. But if the angle of rotation is small, then that's a real vector. What does it mean? It means that there is always a mistake. There is always an error. If you write down like first vector plus second vector equals the second vector plus the first vector of rotation. All these are rotations. Rotations about different axes by different angles. So this equation is always approximate. It always gives you incorrect result. But the error will be small and very small if you choose small angles. For small angles, this will be almost correct with high degree of precision. And the error can be neglected if the angles are small. But if the angles are large, then that will be absolutely incorrect. So the error is small only for small angles. And if there is practically no error for small angles, then we can introduce the, ang the vector of angular velocity, which is, which is defined by this equation. Differential of the rotation angle is a small angle, small like one degree or one hundredth part of a degree. It's a small angle, which uh, the angle of rotation during very small time interval. So if this is a small angle, then we can introduce the uh, angular velocity. And the angular velocity will be real angle. So the uh, real, real vector, so that two vectors, two such vectors can be added. 
because small, small angles of rotation satisfy this equation. And if small angles satisfy this equation, then the vector of angular velocity will also satisfy this equation. So angular velocity is the vector which is directed here. And its direction can also be found by a uh, motion of the screw. If we rotate the screw just in the direction where point A goes, then the screw will go in the direction of vector omega. So I will make another, another drawing here. And I will choose point A and vector of angular velocity defined by this formula. And point A is described by some vector r, which is a function of time, certainly. If we have some origin with respect to which we choose to define the vector of point A moving along the circular orbit. So that vector A moves here, and the velocity of vector A is directed here. We know that the velocity is directed along the trajectory, uh, the vector of velocity is tangential to the circuit, uh, to this uh, circular orbit. Uh, it's tangent. It's, a, it's directed along the tangent line because by definition of velocity along the curved trajectory, we have to take small delta s, small delta s, ds. And if we take small ds, then the small segment will be directed along the tangent. That's obvious. And you know this fact from the previous semester. So uh, we have point A, which is described by some vector r as a function of time, because point A moves. And also point A has some velocity, which is directed along the tangent line in each point, tangent line to its trajectory. And also we have vector of angular velocity of this point. Can we somehow express the velocity using the angular velocity? That's the question. Can we express the velocity using the angular velocity? In order to find the velocity, we have to find somehow its direction correctly, uh, express the direction and the magnitude of this vector. I will assume that the velocity is given by the following formula. Velocity is directed in the plane of this circular trajectory. So it's this velocity is perpendicular to the axis, because axis of rotation is perpendicular to the plane in which the uh, trajectory lies in which the trajectory belongs and in which the velocity vector belongs. So velocity v is perpendicular to omega. And also velocity v is perpendicular to this vector r. So how can we construct a vector which is perpendicular to some other vector? We must use a so-called vector product or cross product of two vectors. And uh, I would write it in this way. This must be something like something like that. If we organize such a cross product of two vectors, vector omega and vector r, then what will be the, the result of this cross product? First of all, the direction of this, uh, of this cross product, a vector product. In order to find the direction, we have to move first vector omega to the second vector r and see where uh, the screw will go if we rotate it in the same 
direction. This screw will go exactly in the uh, direction of velocity. So the direction is correct. And now I will try to find the magnitude of this vector. And in order to find the magnitude, mm, uh, the magnitude, I will, I will <coughs> yeah, yeah, I will put it in this way, omega times, and vector r will be represented as the sum of vector parallel to a component of vector r parallel to the axis, and another component perpendicular to the axis. I will put it in this way, that vector r is its parallel component plus another component perpendicular to the axis of rotation. And so if I put it here like this parallel plus perpendicular component, then I open these brackets and obtain omega times r parallel plus omega r perpendicular. If we consider the first term in this formula, omega multiplied uh, by vector parallel to the omega. What do you remember what is the expression for a vector product? The magnitude of this vector from mathematics is equal to the magnitude of the first vector, the length of the first vector, times the length of the second, times the sine of angle between these two vectors. And the sine of angle here is zero, because the r parallel vector is directed along the omega. So the sine, uh, the, the uh, angle between these two vectors is zero. And so the sine of this angle is zero. Therefore, this component is, this first term is zero. And the second term, uh, the second term is very simple. If I want to find the magnitude of velocity, I will have to find the magnitude of this vector product. But these two vectors are perpendicular to each other. And in order to find the magnitude of this vector product, I have to find, I have to write down the magnitude of the first vector, the magnitude of the second vector, and the sine of angle between them. But the angle between them is 90 degrees. So the sine is unit, is one. So that will be the magnitude of the vector velocity. Which is correct, we know from the previous, from the first semester, that the velocity of a point in its circular motion should be expressed like this, uh, angular velocity times radius. So we obtained, using this formula, we obtained correct direction of velocity and correct length of this vector, correct magnitude. You remember when I wrote this formula, I was not sure it was correct. I just uh, assumed that we could use this formula. And uh, the logic was the following. I, I assumed that this formula was correct, and then I proved first that this formula gives the correct direction for vector velocity, and then second, that this formula gives the correct magnitude of the vector velocity. So this formula, which was written like on intuitive basis without any derivation, we assumed that it was correct, and now we have proved that it is correct. <coughs> now, Using this formula, we will find we will consider the issue of acceleration of a point that moves along a circular trajectory. The acceleration. The vector of acceleration, by definition, is the first derivative of velocity, velocity dot. And the velocity is given 
actually by this formula. So in order to find the time derivative of vector product of two vectors, omega and r perpendicular, I have to use the rules for taking a derivative of the product of two quantities. The rule is very simple. First, I have to differentiate the first term in this product, and the second remains as it was. And then, plus, uh, plus I have to take the derivative of the second term in this product while the first remains as it was. So it will be uh, omega dot vector product by r perpendicular plus omega vector product by r perpendicular. According to the rules of taking a, finding a derivative of the product of two functions, of two variables. <coughs> we take the derivative of the first term, first coefficient, and then plus the derivative of the second. Such are the rules. <coughs> I don't know whether you have studied these rules in calculus or not, but you will certainly study. If not, you, you must learn about it, because physics requires this knowledge. If physics requires some knowledge which you have not yet uh, studied, not yet considered in your calculus lectures, then you must learn it by yourself. No other way. So what is omega dot? This is the change of omega. Omega dot is the change of omega in time, the very small time interval and corresponding change in omega. So the omega, if the axis remains unchanged, the axis remains the same. We don't consider situations like in this uh, lecture demonstration when the axis was moving. We don't consider the moving axis. We consider the case when the axis is fixed. If axis is fixed, then the change of omega is the acceleration, angular acceleration. It may be directed either upward or downward. If vector omega is increasing, then the angular acceleration is directed upward. If the angular velocity omega is decreasing, then the derivative uh, angu uh, angular acceleration will be directed downward. So this is angular acceleration, vector of angular acceleration. And the second term will give you what is vector r dot. By definition, vector r dot, I, I mean r perpendicular, dot by definition is r perpendicular at time moment t plus dt minus r perpendicular at the time moment t divided by dt. Actually, this, uh, actually this thing. So uh, by definition, this is just a velocity. The vector of velocity v. So let's think about the direction of these two terms. The first term shall be directed What's the direction? Vector of a vector epsilon multiplied in a vector uh, vector vector product of e uh, vector epsilon by r perpendicular. If you if you take this vector product, you will see that the direction of this vector will be uh, th this vector will be directed along the velocity perpendicular. It will be perpendicular both to the radius vector r perpendicular. And uh, 
uh, to the vector epsilon. So this is a vector which is called a tangential acceleration, a tangential acceleration which is directed along the tangent line uh, coinciding with the vector velocity. And the tangential acceleration will be positive if vector epsilon is directed upward, that is, if the angular velocity is increasing, then the A tangential will be positive and directed along the velocity vector. But if the v if vector epsilon is negative, then the uh, tangential acceleration will have opposite direction. It, it will be oppositely directed. So this, this term is called a tangential acceleration, and it's directed uh, along the tangent line to uh, tangent line tangent to the trajectory and the second term if we look at there the second term is directed a vector product of vector omega times vector v if we make this vector product you will understand that this will be a uh, some vector directed to the axis of rotation along the radius vector so this vector is called a normal acceleration. This is a normal acceleration directed to the center of rotation. Also, this normal acceleration is called a centripetal acceleration. So we have the formula. The total acceleration equals the tangential acceleration plus normal acceleration. And for this reason, the magnitude of vector A can be calculated as the magnitude of tangential acceleration squared plus the magnitude of normal acceleration squared, because these two vectors are perpendicular. And so we can use the Pythagorean theorem uh, to calculate the total, uh, to calculate the magnitude of the total acceleration. The magnitude of a vector is usually designated by the same letter, by the same character without vector sign. So this is simply A without this arrow. That is the usual designation for the length of vector A. And so I used the same notation here. Uh, uh, character A without the arrow is the magnitude of this vector. In this way, we can find the total acceleration. How can I show the total acceleration at, on this scheme? I have to add two vectors, vector of normal acceleration or centripetal acceleration and vector of tangential acceleration. And in order to add them, I can draw a par parallelogram, and that will be the vector of total acceleration of the body. as the vector sum of normal acceleration and tangential acceleration. And uh, if we now recall that the velocity is vector product of omega times r, then the normal acceleration can be expressed as the vector product of omega times omega by vector r, which is actually vector r perpendicular to the axis. If we take the magnitude of this vector, just its length, I use the same notation without the arrow, showing that this is not a vector. This is a scalar quantity, the scalar equal to the length of this vector. Then, in order to calculate the length of this vector product, we have to take into account that omega and r are perpendicular to each other. So the length of this vector is just omega r and times omega, which is also perpendicular to this vector. So the result will be omega squared r perpendicular. That will be, that will be 
the length of this vector. And if we just one more minute, if we take if we take into account that uh, omega r is the velocity, omega r is the m magnitude of vector v, then we have here the formula omega v. And also, if I multiply this formula by radius and divide by radius, I will obtain omega squared r squared divided by r. And omega r is velocity, so that will be velocity squared divided by r. You know this formula, velocity squared divided by radius. This is a centripetal acceleration. That is the length of the vector of normal acceleration. So on this point, let us finish this lecture. Thank you all. And tomorrow, uh, some of you will go to labs. Please raise your hands. Who will go tomorrow to the labs? OK. It will be on the fifth floor here, room number 506. And uh, those who will go on Saturday, the same, the same room 506. Okay, we finish on this point. Goodbye.